Hi, my name is Bob Greenia, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I want to go over a paper by a chap called Takaaki Matsumoto and Kazura uh, Kurokawa from Hokkaido University, Sapporo in Japan. Now, this was received March the 19th, 1991, and uh, basically I just want to say a few things about uh, Takaaki Matsumoto. I basically only came aware of him after I was at Sochi. In a later presentation, I will talk about how that came about. However, I have to say that this guy is a really insightful individual right from the outset in 1989. And what he presents in his uh, papers are simple, affordable, and well-described experiments. Moreover, he also made the assumption that since cold fusion was doing something unexpected, uh, trying to look for the expected signatures from normal fusion was probably the wrong approach. So, you know, let's let's try doing some simple experiments with what is supposed to produce the effect, uh, little novelties around that, and, and, and see what could be seen. So he really didn't have any concern for any excess heat, uh, and he kind of took a similar approach to my own approach over the last couple of years uh, as a way to learn uh, what was going on in the process. And essentially, he was looking for unusual structures, uh, uh, elemental or radiographic emission uh, features uh, as a result of the experiments he was doing. Uh, and I'll, as I go through this presentation, uh, I think you'll see that there's some very, very important findings right in this early time, in early 1991. Uh, uh, when you Look at what he's done. If you take the particular experiment that's uh, described here, which, as I say, is very well described, uh, and you ran it, you could use some of the techniques line used by using the X-ray, uh, self-developing X-rays, or the uh, sort of plastic uh, polycarbonate and, and looking under a laser microscope, or possibly the most cheap and accessible one is to use the webcam, the Logitech 910C, and also uh, the Cosmic Ray Finder. Anyway, let's get to it. So the paper is called Observation of Heavy Elements Produced During Explosive Cold Fusion. That sounds very dangerous. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> dig into this. Um, so I think right from the first paragraph I've highlighted here, he's showing the beginnings of a good understanding of what's going on in the process. Many body fusion reactions may take place during cold fusion. Heavy elements are observed that might have been produced by such reactions during electrolysis of heavy water. Elements such as sodium, magnesium, aluminium, and zinc are observed inside grain-shaped defects in palladium rod used in a cold fusion experiment. So obviously he's put his provisos in there and that's understandable. So I'm just gonna take you through uh, and I'll, I'll put a link to this uh, paper so that you can uh, look at it in your own time. Now, right from the introduction, second paragraph, reference one is a reference to his own work, uh, indicates that cold fusion takes place in the grain boundaries of a host metal. I would absolutely agree with that. He then goes on to describe the process. Now, what I will say about this guy is he was open-minded and he regularly changed uh, his uh, views, uh, but kept a core belief. Uh, he went with his um, gut feeling, and I think that was a good gut feeling. Uh, however, um, I, I, I agree with this, and uh, basically a grain boundary has a <laughs> impedance mismatch, as does a surface. And so um, the active agent does not like to cross it, so uh, it starts to dishevel or, or, or performs work uh, in those uh, places. Uh, so uh, moving on, um, he's saying, uh, microscopic observations of palladium metal used for cold fusion experiment have shown that as cold fusion proceeds, tiny spot defects grow into grain-shaped defects in which materials disappear by extraordinary burning disappear by extraordinary burning. That's very interesting observation. I happen to agree with it. The formation processes of uh, grain-shaped defects seem complicated, but it is highly probable that many body fusion reactions take place to produce heavy elements. I would agree with that also. This is not just deuterium and deuterium. This is many body. It isn't just like two deuteriums coming together. This is many, many deuteriums coming together, even if you're just talking about a, a DD system. So uh, a normal uh, 
fusion, let's say you have deuterium and a tritium, you're, you're firing those at very high velocity to each other and it's a two-body problem. Uh, this is not, in my opinion, a two-body problem necessarily. Uh, he goes on uh, and saying, in the grain shape defects, two processes may occur uh, by which heavier elements rather than direct fusion products such as helium might be produced during cold fusion. A many body fusion reaction or hy uh, of hydrogen atoms or transmutation of the host element. Now, transmutation is basically going both ways. So uh, the first process um, uh, produces heavy elements from light hydrogen atoms instantaneously by many body fusion reactions or sequentially by absorbing hydrogen atoms or electrons. This is similar to processes that take place to form cold stars such as the Earth. Now, this is a really insightful, I don't know why he said this, but it is really insightful, given the recent findings of particles that are unexplained coming out from Antarctica. Essentially, his experiment was loading a palladium rod in deuterium with a bit of sodium chloride. Uh, he gives all the details of that, and there's a really nice um, uh, diagram, and based on the size uh, you, you can basically work out exactly how this uh, was running. And essentially, he loaded it for 19 days with a, a 0.8 to 1 amp uh, current and 5 volt bias. And uh, then he uh, lowered the water level such that hydrogen formed above and there was an explos explosion. So this is really inspired. He's loading the material. And then, uh, in my view, whether this was intentional or not, uh, he is triggering the cold fusion to occur by, one, allowing migration of the hydrogen through the material. Uh, so there's, there's some sort of uh, production of hydrogen out, out of the top uh, of, of the material. Uh, and secondly, he's using a shock, uh, which, as we know from many experimenters, uh, looks like a way to produce um, uh, 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 cold fusion triggering. Uh, and so uh, that's a shock wave, both uh, of sound and, and pressure um, that will go into the metal and so forth. So, uh, so it's a really ingenious and simple experiment. And he repeated this a number of times. So uh, the results, uh, he has a flow chart of the experiment, shows how that it works. So it's, like I said, it's a very well described uh, experiment. Figure three shows optical microscopy picture of longitudinal cross section of palladium metal. It clearly shows that cold fusion has taken place violently near the surface uh, of the palladium. The surface layers seem to have acted as barriers against hydrogen escape. So hydrogen is heavily concentrated under the surface. Figure four shows an interesting burn pattern. A series of grain shaped defects uh, are arranged along an inclined layer that might have prevented an upward flow of hydrogen. Okay, so this is the real kicker in this presentation. So the first is these kind of uh, surfaced uh, um, defects. Now, uh, as my view, I'm kind of in, in line with shoulders when it gets to the uh, impedance mismatch between the, the metal which it likes to be in and the electrolytic uh, solution of deuterium and sodium chloride. It doesn't like to go across there. The active agent uh, dishevels and then the disheveled uh, fragments uh, do their work uh, on the boundary layer. This is the same as it would occur in between two grain, uh, a boundary between two grains. So anyway, that's that. But the second part of that paragraph is the real beauty here. So I'm going to show you that. Here it is. What is this? So here's our surface of the palladium, and we have a zigzag per periodic track. Here we go. OK, this guy published this uh, in early 1991. Likely the work was done in 1990. This, to my mind, is the very first example of strange radiation published uh, in the uh, Lena cold fusion, cold nuclear transmutation literature. Now, I challenge you to go out and find an earlier one. I'm sure there is. I'm absolutely certain that if you were able to uh, look at uh, uh, Tesla's work in the museum in, in Serbia, you'd probably find in some of those sort of uh, pre-X-ray X-rays, uh, as Alan Goldwater said, maybe there, there are uh, some signs in there. But this, to me, uh, these kind of triangular or semi-triangular, and look at this. Look at this. We have our bow tie, the triangle, 
a triangle, and a little bit coming out from the side. Exactly what we saw in that line track that we published at the end of September in 2017. This, for me, is unequivocally the first example I know of a published strange radiation track. Uh, and uh, again, uh, if you can find something sooner, I'd be very happy uh, to uh, look into that. So see what you can find. Okay, so other than the strange radiation track, he also has these uh, burnt out areas, as he calls them, these grains. And in, in other papers, he describes how it starts on the surface boundary and then it kind of like uh, moves in and just consumes the whole grain. But it, it like starts and skips and starts and then then you, you end up with eating the whole, whole grain, as it were. Uh, now, he then goes on uh, uh, to talk about, um, so he talks about the the things there. He then talks about how they deloaded the material before um, by having it over 800 degrees C for 10 hours and so forth. And, and then after the experiment, they showed what they found by uh, analyzing the gas that came out of that. So that's interesting because uh, they found uh, uh, apparent, uh, possibly, uh, neon and uh, uh, the production of uh, lithium uh, as well as tritium and also um, uh, helium and also fluorine. Uh, so that's that's good from a, a resi residual gas uh, analysis. Uh, but these are the bits that are really, really interesting that he goes into more detail of. So he then says here... Um, uh, he describes what they've got in them, but I'll go to the conclusion later uh, and just draw out the important point from that. Anyway, uh, they, in reference four, he describes how some heavy elements that are, seem to be transmuted from the palladium are formed, ruthenium and indium, uh, and it's down here. So he's saying that w within the metal, there appears to be some production of ruthenium and indium, and uh, I've given a couple of links here in this PDF and you can go and see on fuzzfizz.org uh, how you might achieve the production of indium and ruthenium through, through uh, uh, nuclear exchange reactions or, or, or fusion reactions. So that's uh, uh, that. Uh, then uh, he goes on and so it says, figure eight is an SEM picture of a grain shaped defect in which the materials are left somewhat unburned. Figure 9 shows an EDX spectrum at some point E. Uh, figure 8, the energy spectrum is different from the standard one. It is remarkable that elements such as silicon, sulfur, and calcium exist among the materials remaining inside the grain-shaped defects. Now, let's have a look at some of these grain-shaped defects. So he's picked out one here, and you've got A, B, C, D, so he's only referring... He's just really looking at the palladium in those cases, but let's have a look at some of these grain-shaped defects, E. E, we have a, a, a sample here, and you've got silicon, sulfur, calcium. Now, here's a different grain shape de defect in figure 10, and he does a sample on that, and it has sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, calcium, and copper. Wow, what are these? These are all the classic George Oshawa reaction products. Uh, obviously, you've got sodium and uh, chlorine in the, the NaCl, the, the electrolyte, but Everything else that you're seeing are what you get out, your standard George Oshawa reaction products. And as we've already described, they are the kind of uh, reactions you get out of uh, ball lightning. And we've observed on uh, uh, various uh, different systems, uh, including uh, the work of John Hutchison. And so let's go on. Um, he then comes down to here. Finally, the weight of the palladium metal was measured by an electric balance before and after the experiment. Values were before 11.3497 and afterwards 11.3506. He degassed before doing that. Pr prior to degassing, it, it was 11.53 grams. So you can see there was a lot of gas held in that material, whatever that gas was. And after the degassing, it was still heavier despite the fact that large areas, well, not necessarily large, but areas of the material had basically, in his own words, uh, he says here, uh, they'd basically been disappeared. They'd basically gone, um, uh, burnt out, as he calls it. So, um, uh, okay, so... In his discussion here, it is remarkable that heavy elements have been observed by EDX inside green shaped defects. The elements that have been recognized are neon, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, 
silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argi, argon, uh, potassium, calcium, titanium, chromium, iron, nickel, copper, and zinc. It is difficult to consider... Uh, we go down to the bottom. la di da di da uh, 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 These elements to be impurities. It can be concluded that the elements have been produced by many body fusion reactions instantaneously or sequentially. Uh, the materials remaining inside the grain-shaped defects have extremely different mass distributions. And here, here we have another of one of his great insights, which suggests that the distribution might depend on how much many body fusion reactions have occurred. So he's saying, like, if you look at the various grains, different grains, different grains have a different distribution of elements in them. Okay. So he's essentially saying that this one burnt in a, a different intensity to this. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with him. No, and this is also very interesting. No elements heavier than zinc have been observed up to the present since fusion reactions that produce heavier elements than zinc have negative reaction energies. It is difficult to produce them at a higher rate. It needs a higher burning rate. Right. So the heaviest element we typically saw in an aluminium sample from uh, Hutchison, which you will see when we look at the analysis from uh, uh, Synthes Tech uh, later this month, uh, is uh, zinc. And here we have a reason from a nuclear scientist why that is. Uh, the fusion reactions that produce heavier elements have negative reaction energies. Moreover, uh, when we think about uh, the work of uh, Suhas Ralkar, that produced apparently lead, zirconium, niobium, and these do obviously have a, a, a lot higher uh, uh, than, they are obviously a lot higher than zinc. And so the suggestion is there was a much higher burning rate or somehow much more energy was being uh, uh, put into assembling those nucleons. So um, this really would go so far as to explain that uh, you know, if you if you want to be creating uh, energy from just straight fusion, you want to be kind of uh, below zinc uh, or, or transmutations around that area. So this this is totally fascinating, um, really, really uh, insightful. Here's another piece of insight. Mass spectroscopy of discharged gas shows that light elements or molecules of mass 2, 3, 4, 6, 17, 18, 19 and 20 have been produced. These can be classified into two groups, those with masses of 2, 3, and 4, and those whose mass, uh, with masses of 6, six 17, uh, 18, 19, and 20. The former have been produced inside the metal and the latter near the surface. So inside the metal, you're kind of basically getting fusion of like the hydrogen that's in there, the, so the deuterium that's actually in, in the metal lattice. That's what you're getting the the two, three, and fours. So your um, uh, your masses. This is deuterium, uh, tritium, and and uh, helium, or or a deuterium molecule, or so forth. He, he describes it above here in in these charts. So let's go and have a look at that. So uh, you've got these uh, two, three, four here. So it could be four helium or D two, or tritium or three helium, uh, and deuterium. And then you've got this six lithium, six helium, and D three here. So he's saying those those lighter elements are actually caused by fusion with inside the material. Okay, the second group uh, with six, seventeen, uh, eighteen. Uh, so so six is lithium, uh, maybe or, uh, or or T two or maybe I, I don't know. Um, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. So you've got uh, fluorine and, and and so forth in here. Um, these are on the surface, and this makes a lot of sense because this is where your active agent would break up. So, uh, you know, in, in uh, shoulders, uh, sorry, Hutchison samples, you, you see the production, say, of sulfur on the surface uh, because you're getting uh, a George Oshawa reaction of using two oxygen 16s to form sulfur 32. So um, uh, the, the heavier elements are, are because uh, it's being destabilized and it's, it's in, th th this is a hypothesis on my point of view, but uh, uh, this is a nice piece of information to put in the mix. But really... The, the main thing I wanted to talk about uh, uh, this first uh, paper I'm introducing you to of uh, Matsumoto is that, one, uh, he recognizes from 
uh, probably 1990, that this is the case of many body fusion reactions. That there are different types of fusion reactions going on, both between light elements to make heavier elements and uh, transmutations of uh, helium, uh, heavy elements, both backwards and forwards. This is very, very accurate to my understanding uh, as, as of present. It's a very well described pres uh, uh, experiment that pretty much anyone can do. Um, I mean, when I say anyone, you've got to be aware that this <laughs> needs deuterium and it needs expensive palladium in, 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 in platinum wires, but not a lot of it. And uh, you have to be aware that you are actually seeking a hydrogen explosion and that that could be extremely dangerous. He even says that uh, he expects that some of the energy that came uh, out of the explosion was uh, a, um, uh, a, a, from from the fusion uh, energy. Now, what I uh, what I saw with uh, Suhas Ralkar and and I um, uh, gave uh, produced in a, a video called uh, "Brilliant Light Shower" uh, was these intense uh, bursts of of, of light, and uh, uh, these could be. Uh, the simultaneous like cascade breakdown of a large number of uh, uh, charge clusters within uh, the container. So uh, that needs to be borne in mind that, that, that this isn't necessarily a chemical explosion. And so uh, people need to have the right precautions, uh, fume cupboard, uh, uh, safe distance, plexiglass, and all the things that you, you would might want to save yourself from, from harm. But the other thing that is just absolutely beautiful and quite magical for me is to see that probably in 1990, maybe sooner, but certainly by early, what is it? Uh, uh, this day's just amazing. March the 19th to 1991. There is already someone that has the guts to say, look, I've seen this thing. It looks unusual. Obviously, it's completely dissimilar to all kind of normal sort of uh, uh, radiation tracks. And uh, and here it is. Uh, zoom into one of the little uh, things, and you have your uh, bow tie that we saw in the Lion reactor. So I have to say thank you to Matsumoto uh, uh, and his colleagues at Hokkaido University. And uh, uh, in future presentations, I will um, uh, reference this guy. How I came about um, uh, his work. Uh, following Sochi and uh, uh, how uh, <laughs> it really it, it's quite weird uh, to um, see a guy that's not worried about excess heat. He's just doing sound experiments, well described and looking at the inputs and outputs uh, in, in a physical and radiographic sense. So thank you. Uh, enjoy this paper.